Imagine a world which is powered by mini、uh, versions of the sun that are man-made, where elect- electricity can zip around the countryside、um, in vast, vast quantities, using very, very little energy itself. So, with very low loss,、um, from the North Sea、um, wind farms, from the southern European solar farms, to wherever we need it. Where machines that guzzle huge amounts of energy can be made much more efficient, where our data centres、um, can use a lot less power, where we can zip around wherever we like、um, in electrical aircraft that are clean, in levitating trains, and we don't have to worry about the environmental damage it's doing. These things sound like science fiction, but in fact, with superconductors. Um, they can be a reality. This is what superconductors can offer, and this is why earlier this summer, the world went a bit crazy、um, about superconductors.、Um, some of you may have heard about it.、Um, there was a big announcement by a group in Korea that they discovered a room temperature superconductor, the Holy Grail,、um, a superconductor that works at room temperature, at room pressure, doesn't need any cooling, anything like that.、Um, And everybody went mad. Everybody who heard about it、uh, was was excited about the possibilities that this would mean、um, for our energy、uh, consumption in this in in the world. Unfortunately, this material they called LK99 isn't a room temperature superconductor. So that dream was rather short-lived.、Um, the scientific community did their job and researched this very carefully、um, and quickly. And discovered it didn't superconduct after all.、Um, but that might sound a bit negative. But actually, we've got superconducting materials that work. We've got them right now,、um, and they can deliver on these transformational technologies、um, straight away, right now. So let's just look a little bit、um, into the details of what we're talking about. This is a very simple cartoon. Um, of how energy gets around at the moment,、um, 12% of our greenhouse gas emissions come from transport, from the petrol and the diesel and the kerosene used in trains and, and cars and aeroplanes and boats. And about 80% of our homes are powered by gas,、um, which is like we were burning a fossil fuel when we're heating our homes. One of the things that the government want to do is to switch us to more electric technologies, electric vehicles,、um, use different methods to heat our homes, to、um, ban the sale in future of gas boilers,、um, and that's one of the ways in which they think we can make this more environmentally friendly. We could use hydrogen as a fuel instead,、um, and that as well、um, won't solve all of our problems.、Um, but if we do this, What's the consequence? So all of these things need electricity now that didn't before. That means we've got to produce it somewhere, and it's completely counterproductive if we produce that by burning more coal and gas and oil in our power stations. So at the moment, 12% of our energy or of our, of our、um, emissions come from burning these fossil fuels in power stations to make electricity. If we want to, if we want to power other things like this with electricity as well, our global consumption is going to go up hugely,、um, and so we're going to need to make a lot more ele- electricity. And all of the predictions, even the most favourable ones, suggest that by increasing our renewable energy,、um, wind farms, solar farms, those kinds of things, that's not going to be enough on its own、um, to. Meet the growing demand that we have for electricity going forward, and by 2050 we'll still be reliant on on fossil fuels. So what else could we do?、Uh, we heard on this stage yesterday somebody talking about nuclear fission.、Um, so we could increase our capacity of nuclear fission. In fact, our, a lot of our fission power plants are coming to end of life or have come to end of life,、um, and these aren't things that you can just build in a day.、Um, so building back up the capability will take. Um, decades, actually, unless we use novel technologies like the one she was talking about yesterday. What else could we do? Nuclear fusion is a promise that's been around for years.、Um, it's always talked about that it's 30 years away. Can we do something to bring that forward? So, nuclear fusion is the bonding together of、um, hydrogen,、uh, hydrogen nuclei 
um, heavy hydrogen and even heavier hydrogen, you make helium nuclei and extremely fast energetic neutrons, and that's where you get the energy from. So we need to consider these, these new technologies as well as renewables um, to, to meet the growing demand. What are the consequences? Well, if we're using more renewables, that's intermittent, it's variable. So we're going to need to store the energy um, until we need it. So when it's very windy in the North Sea, we can generate lots of energy there, um, but we may not need it all at once, we've got to store it on grid scale. Um, of course, there's energy storage in cars as well for electric vehicles and batteries and things like this, but this is grid scale energy storage I'm talking about here. So that's all about the sort of switching to electric, um, how we're going to generate the electricity we need um, and store it. But what else could we do? We could try to reduce the emissions um, from what we're using. So we could try to make our devices more energy efficient. 42% um, of our electricity is used in motors of one kind or another. So could we make them more efficient? 8% of our electricity is lost just getting it from A to B across the countryside. Um, so what could we do about that? Improve efficiency. And of course, if we're going to make everything more electric, we're going to have to get more electricity around. We're going to have to increase capacity as well. Our grid can't cope um, with our, the demands um, for electricity that we're going to have in the future. So how can superconductors help? Uh, that's what I'm going to talk about for the next sort of 15 minutes or so. Um, and I think we'll start by playing the video, please. So what you can see up here is some superconductors that we show to students who come round in our, in our labs. These are our um, levitating demos, and you can watch those whilst I'm telling you about what superconductors are. Um, these kinds of levitation, um, of course, could be used for maglev trains. That's what our demo is doing here. Um, but it could also be used for things like frictionless bearings, where you've got rotating machines, um, flywheel energy storage, for example. You could make that a lot more energy efficient if you don't have friction at the rotating parts. But the fundamental part of superconductivity or superconductors that's going to make them useful for net zero is the fact that they can carry um, electricity without any resistance at all. They're not just good conductors, they're perfect conductors of electricity, um, provided we cool them down. We've got to make them cool with something like liquid nitrogen like we're showing in these, in these demos. So provided we get them cool, they can, electrons can whiz around them, inside them, without encountering any resistance. What does that mean? Well, it means that if we, for example, um, it, it's like if we had a shopping trolley. If we just gave it a push across the floor here, it wouldn't travel very far before it stopped. But superconductivity is like frictionless electricity. So if we start a current going in a superconducting circuit, it will carry on going forever. We can take away the power supply. We don't need it anymore. Okay? And that's exactly how MRI machines work. If you have an MRI scan, you get wheeled inside a big superconducting magnet. It's operating at minus 269 degrees C. That's four degrees above absolute zero. It's cooled with something called liquid helium. And in that machine, in that MRI machine, when it's installed in the hospital, a power supply is taken. They start the current going in the magnet. They then close a special switch and take the power supply away. And it's no longer there. That current will go around forever and ever, and the field it produces will stay completely stable, which is what you need for MRI. So the material we use for those has been around for the best part of 100 years. It's called niobium titanium. Um, and liquid helium is, is not easy stuff, um, and it, it won't be useful for power cables and things like that, cooling power cables. But in the late, late 1980s, um, a whole brand new kind of superconductors were discovered, ones that never, nobody could ever have predicted, um, and these are called the high-temperature superconductors. Um, they work at a staggering temperature of minus 180 degrees C, which still sounds hugely cold to most people. Um, but the really great thing about these is that um, they can work above the boiling point of liquid nitrogen. And liquid nitrogen, which is what we're using here in that cup, um, that is very cheap. It costs about the same amount as milk, um, whereas liquid helium costs about the same as whiskey. So you can see that it, it, it enables a whole new um, raft of technologies um, just because we can operate at this much higher temperature. Um, all right, I think we'll go back to the slides, please. 
So the most obvious one of these applications that I showed where superconductors can make a difference is in transmission lines. So this is just electricity cables, the long-distance power cables that go across the countryside. So up here on the left, um, you can see the underground cables, they're just coming out of the ground there. They're superconducting cables. They carry as much electricity as all of those overhead cables you can see up there. This is a demonstrator project in Long Island, um, and it's been running for, for quite a number of years now. Um, so not only do superconductors allow us to um, transmit electricity with, with um, no resistance, but they also allow us to transmit a lot more electricity. So the same diameter of wire can transmit probably 50 times as much power um, as a normal copper cable would do. Um, so we need a lot less of it. And so for lots of applications, this fact that we can, we can get a lot of current through a very small diameter of wire um, is very useful. And for cables, um, it's particularly useful because it means that even with all the cooling and things we need, we can retrofit underground cables um, and increase their capacity probably by about five times just without having to do any new rights of way or anything like that. So one of the, this is at this, I have to point out, this is a manufacturer of coated conductor who are obviously, which is the kind of material we're talking about here, who are obviously going to want to sell their material. They say that they can decrease the energy by 77%, um, and that is including cooling. Okay? It's not very difficult to make these cables. They look something like this. Um, you have layers of, of this material wrapped around, um, and inside you've got a channel for the liquid nitrogen and another one around the outside for them to return. So it isn't, it isn't too tricky to do it. So what else could we do? That's one type of demonstrator. We've got lots of other demonstrator projects that have, been, um, that have used superconductors. Um, this one's a fairly recent project, um, which is called the EcoSwing project, uh, where they uh, fitted a wind turbine, three megawatt wind turbine, uh, with a superconducting coil instead of a, a normal conventional coil. And they, could, they operated, I think, for about 600 hours, so not terribly long. Um, but it performed just as well as the as the conventional one, and it weighed 40% less. So that gives you some idea of, of the benefits here. One of the benefits for, for, for wind turbine generators is that um, superconductors um, mean that you can shrink everything. So we could make the same power out of a, a much smaller turbine if we use superconducting technology. And that's great, particularly for offshore, where you have a, a huge amount of expense goes into um, to all the platforms that have to support these, these enormous... Um, devices. Other things, well, there are various transport um, projects that have been going on. This is a fairly old one now, actually, the US Navy propulsion motor. Um, a much more recent one is electric aircraft. Um, so there are initiatives like Flight Path 2050, um, where we want all our aircraft to be fully electric by then. Um, and actually, the sums don't really work out for, for normal sort of commercial passenger aircraft um, very well. Um, and the problem is that if you're going to make them electric, the motors and generators you need are too heavy. If we could use superconducting ones, um, even with the cooling, um, then it becomes, it becomes feasible. And so Airbus are, are looking at a project on that right now. Energy storage, I mentioned. There are superconducting versions of energy storage that can be grid scale. So just essentially, it's a big magnet that we can put supercurrent into, um, and it stays there until you want to get it out again. Um, because it's no resistance, it doesn't cost very much to do it, so, so they're a good technology. Flywheel energy storage is another I've mentioned. Last but not least, I want to talk about fusion, um, because fusion is quite important to high-temperature superconductors. Um, it might seem a bit weird, because fusion reaction happens at 150 million degrees C. Superconductors operate at low temperature. And in these compact ma machines, like the ones being developed by Tokamak Energy, which is a private UK company, they're talking about distances between the plasma at 150 million degrees C and the magnets being something like this. Okay, so tight, you know, really huge temperature gradients. Um, the magnets are needed to do the job that gravity does in the sun. It pushes all those um, nuclei close enough together that they can fuse. Um, this is a magnet demonstrator that Tokamak Energy are building right now. And um, this is close to my heart because my research group are working on the materials um, that will be used in this kind, of, this kind of reactor. It won't work without superconductors. Uh, fusion won't work without superconductors commercially for power plants. And these are the small-scale power plants that are likely to be there in much shorter time scale than we're talking for the, for the big um, 
conventional type of fusion reactor. They have to have high temperature superconductor. So what's the problem? Why don't we see superconductors everywhere? Why aren't they all around us right now? We've had these high temperature superconductors for 35 years. Um, and the real problem comes down to the fact that they're very difficult and expensive to make. It's not that they have to be cooled with liquid nitrogen. It's because they're really difficult to make. And they're difficult to make because they're ceramics. That's number one reason they're difficult. So they've got the mechanical properties of a teacup. And if you imagine trying to make that kind of material into long lengths of wire, that can be bent and made into cables and, and wound into magnets, you can see what the problem's going to be. They're also very chemically sensitive, so they don't like any atoms to be out of place. Um, and they react with everything. Um, they, it will even react with air, actually, or water in the air, if given the chance. Um, and lastly, they have to be made as a single crystal. Um, so if you've got a kilometer long wire of superconductor, it's all got to be one crystal. And that's because the boundaries between crystals in, in high temperature superconductors act like dams to the current flow. Um, so these things make it really hard. And material scientists have worked for 30, 35 years, 30 years, on ways to do it. And this is the state of the art material. You can be forgiven for, th for thinking it looks like copper tape, because what you're seeing is copper on the outside. Um, but you can see it bends. It's a flexible metal ribbon. And it's made by um, taking a metal substrate, metal ribbon, and multi-layer coating, deposition, of various different oxide layers, and eventually the superconductor. There is one micrometer of superconductor in that, which is um, a millionth of a meter, a thousandth of a millimeter thickness of superconductor. And that material will carry 200 amps. OK, so it's remarkable, absolutely remarkable material, but it's expensive has to be made with vacuum technology. It's all very, very tricky. So our problem has been that the material has leveled out in cost, if you look at the blue line. Um, and this is because nobody will order it, because it's too expensive. The only way to make it cheaper is by having larger volumes of order, uh, orders for it. And that's where the fusion message comes in. Fusion, these small fusion reactors need high temperature superconductor. They need that material. Um, they can't do it with anything else. And even one of the small-scale magnets, half-scale magnets that was built in the US last year, um, just one out of something like 18 they need for a single reactor, that took 270 kilometers of that stuff. And we make 1,000 kilometers globally, annually, of it. So you can see we're going to have to scale up hugely. Um, a single tokamak, like the one I showed you before, will need 10 to 20,000 kilometers of this material to make it work. So we've got this opportunity. The cost can, um, the scaling up will have to happen. And everything that's been done previously in manufacturing advanced materials says that if we scale up volume, we can bring down cost. OK, the practical lower limit of the materials is somewhere here. This is a log scale um, the, the, with the deposition, they think somewhere here. And the technological, um, you know, we're about 100 times more expensive than the low temperature superconductors. But if we can get it down by a factor of 10, then it's commercially viable. OK. There are other things um, that need to happen. Um, we need to be able to learn. We need to learn how these are going to work in long term trials. We need to learn how to integrate them with conventional technologies. We need to have standards. We need to have trained workforce, all of those things. Um, but these materials are ready. They're ready to be used in applications. Um, and, and to get them there, we're going to need public and private um, investment if we want to capitalize on their promise. So I've come pretty much to the end of my time. Um, this is my vision for the future, superconducting future. Um, there's lots of things I haven't talked about in here. I've, I've focused on net zero, quantum computers, superconductors are, are crucial for that. Um, what I want, the message I really wanted to get across was that we have these materials right now. We don't need to wait for a room temperature superconductor. We've got materials that can be used um, right now for these technologies. We've demonstrated them. The, the properties are fantastic. We've demonstrated them in these small scale. We need to demonstrate them on a larger scale um, and just get on with it, I think. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Speller. Um, we've got some time for questions from the audience. We've got some mics that will be circulating. So put your hand up if you have a question. 
We've got some back here too. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I'm David Wood from London Futurist. The chart you showed at the end, the cartoon you showed at the end, had a date 2007 on it. So how much longer do you think it's going to take before this vision is realized? Oh, the, the cartoon I just put up there, okay, that was taken from a, from a publication probably in, in that. Well, some of the things are being done now. MRI is in hospitals. Um, every MRI machine has a superconducting magnet. It wouldn't work without it. So they've been around for a long time. Quantum computers are using superconductors. Of course, they're not, um, they're not large scale or anything yet. Um, the LHC, the particle accelerators, they're already superconducting technologies. Uh, superconducting fusion reactors are being built all over the world, actually, including ITER in the south of France. So quite a lot of these things exist already. The idea of having, for example, all our electricity being transmitted across the countryside um, with superconducting cables, I would hope that you know, in 10 years' time, we would, have, we would be starting to, to make some progress with that, um, given the economies of scale we're expecting with fusion. Fusion is moving at such a huge pace. There's a lot of private investment, six billion um, of private investment in, in fusion. And, uh, and, and they're working in a different way than it's been done before. So if anybody's going to make it happen, I think these, these really inspiring young companies are going to do that. And I thought there were some over here. Hello. Yep. yep. Uh, I'm Ben from Connected Curb. We're an electric charge point company. A fascinating talk. I really enjoyed it. I'm just curious about the civils and the supply chain uh, to roll this technology out. Is this above ground, below ground? Can you just pull it through a trench? How would it roll okay. out? Um, do you mean cables? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, there's lots of details in there that I've skipped over. Um, because at the moment, are sort of depending on, on what kind of cables we're talking about, we use AC cables usually. Um, superconductors are not ideally suited to AC. They're not actually zero loss under alternating current um, situations. So superconducting cables are most likely to be useful where you might be thinking of high voltage DC. So getting um, offshore wind power onshore, these very long distance uh, cables that can connect Europe to, you know, throughout Europe. Um, so DC technology is, is where superconductors are best suited. But we've made AC versions, we've made DC versions. Um, they have been retrofitted in places like Tokyo, where they've got such huge problems with uh, population density that they need to increase their capacity, um, but they don't have anywhere to dig, dig new um, conduits for it. So uh, it can be done. There is a company um, in Ireland, based in Ireland, called Supernode, who are at the moment working on this. Um, in particular for offshore to onshore. Um, and then there are, there's, in Essen, for example, there's a project called Ampacity, um, which is going from one distribution center to another around the city, and that's a superconducting cable. And in fact, even with the cost of the materials at the moment, um, that came out to be pretty much equal um, economically for that application um, to, using, to using conventional um, methods, conventional cables. Yep. Anybody else? We've got about a minute and a half. Don't be shy, this is your time. The man over there, it's coming. Hi, I, that is Aidan from Cambridge Consultant. Um, you mentioned that uh, about 40% of um, electricity used for power electric motor. Um, well, I used to be power uh, electronic engineers, so um, I, I know there's some, some years ago, uh, there were large scale um, uh, electrical generator uh, use a superconductor, particularly for renewable, you mentioned. Yeah. Um, but why not happen on a smaller motor, which is the larger volume? Particularly now we're talking about EV, you know, with all permanent magnet motors. Um, imagine if all those are superconductor motors, that, that would be super. And then you've got a volume as well. So why not happening? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the reason is it only will work if we can cool with liquid nitrogen or some, we can use mechanical cryocoolers to get to these temperatures as well. Um, and the materials are too expensive. They're not, it's not economically viable to do it. It's not that it's not te technologically um, possible, it's that it's not economically viable. So I think it's the materials cost that's been the real barrier. Um, the second thing that I didn't mention that's really important is that Power companies are, are very, really conservative. They've got to distribute this electricity. They've got to know it's reliable. And they're not going to switch to a brand new, rather scary technology that needs cryogenics um, if they don't have to. So we need to make a, a case for where 
how much we can, we can make a difference. You've got to make a big difference before they're going to start considering it as a technology. Thank you very much. I'm afraid that's all we've got time for, for questions now. Please join me in thanking Professor Speller one last time.